it's time we get started. So let's take a moment for prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this time and this place, and we thank you for these people. We ask that you will be with us, be our teacher, our guide, our instructor. May your Holy Spirit have the preeminence here today, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess I will move overhead for a little harder. Okay, we talk about Babylon a lot, and this is a outline of Babylon uh, during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And as we have told you before, even when we were talking in Revelation, and now, and in the next few weeks especially, we will see things that are happening in Babylon. Well, this is Babylon in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, the important thing to see here is, is the river runs right through the center of the city. And uh, uh, that will be very important in one of our future discussions. Now, we had, or did I give you, or did we have a picture of the, of the uh, statue? No. We didn't. We had enough on We had enough on So, anyhow, I have a revised edition of the guy on the screen, and this takes in not only what we saw before, but in the next couple of weeks, uh, we're going to be able to see even more. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, we don't have it. There we go. Uh, yes. And we're going to see a vision something like this with uh, a lion and a bear and a leopard and a uh, fierce beast of Rome with ten horns. Okay. We're going to get to that in a couple of weeks. And I'd like for you to have one of these. And this pictures the image or the, the image that we talked about a few weeks ago. And then on the side it has these animals that you see and how they relate to the statue. So, uh, two, three, four times in the book of Daniel, we see an image that is similar or tells us the same thing about these uh, four or five uh, images or dynasties or kingdoms on this uh, paper that you see. It'll have the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and the Roman that we've talked about before, and uh, they're all put together here. Now, uh, that's part of what we've seen before, and save that paper because that's what we're going to talk about, not today, but one of these days in the future when we talk about this these different kingdoms and what happens to them. Okay? In chapters 2, 4, and 5 uh, we see once again the uh, kingdoms as they're repeated in a different way. We saw the statue and then the animals so uh, God keeps repeating the same thing over and over. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was what we would call today a slow learner. 
<laughs> because uh, in one chapter, after he gets through a terrible thing, he praises God, and then he's back to his old stuff again. You know anybody like that? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so uh, God has to keep repeating the same story over to Nebuchadnezzar because he is a slow learner. And to us. And to us, very much so. Uh, I'm glad you said us, because that means me. <laughs> <coughs> Human beings too often look at uh, a worldly power or worldly wisdom to answer spiritual questions or spiritual decisions. Hmm. Nehemiah should have learned this lesson because as we said, he's a, he's a slow learner. Wealth and power had Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, that's what controlled him. And they cannot resolve the important conundrums of life and that false religions or secular philosophies cannot answer life's deepest questions. So uh, that's one of the important lessons that we have to learn today. It's hard and maybe we are slow learners sometimes, but uh, we see, when we get a problem, what do you do first? You try to solve the problem, or you go to this person or that person, and then as a last resort, what do we do? We go to God. Yeah. And it should be the other way around. We've got it backwards. We, we are slow learners. One true God, as revealed in the Bible itself, is the only reliable source of power and wisdom. That in mind. Okay, our lesson for today, chapter 4, God's rule over Gentile kings. Every chapter, God is ruling over something or another. And so, today, it's God's rule over Gentile kings. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar made this royal proclamation, and this is his story. He's telling this story. It's not somebody else, it's Nebuchadnezzar himself. To teach the people that the Most High God has a kingdom that is sovereign over man and will last forever. Hello, statue. <laughs> <laughs> it was God's calling. Yeah. Should have answered then. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> And this is the lesson that we need to learn today, too. The Most High God has a kingdom that is sovereign over man and will last forever. That's the last lesson that we ever learn, that the kingdom of God that will last for a thousand years is the last one and it will last forever. But anyhow, in this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar is the one that wrote it. Uh, when, they, when they study Nebuchadnezzar, the people that know a lot more than I do, uh, when they study his writings and things, <laughs> they declare that it was Nebuchadnezzar that wrote it. It resembles the style of Nebuchadnezzar in the other ancient manuscripts that they find. 
and it agrees with the other ancient manuscripts. Anyhow, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, let's get to that. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he couldn't figure out what that dream meant. So what did he do? He called in all of his wise men and he told them the dream and asked them to interpret the dream. Well, they did this in four time. Before this, the king would call them in and uh, uh, after he would tell them a dream or something, they would fabricate an answer. But this time, they were at a total loss. And uh, they couldn't do it at all. And finally, who did they bring in to interpret the dream but Daniel? Daniel was brought in. Why? Because he had a reputation beforehand of being able to interpret dreams visions and things like this. So why did they bring him in last if he was the uh, first? Because <laughs> they were slow learners too. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? Same thing. We call on God last. Uh, that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Uh, because Daniel had demonstrated before that he had contact with this God of heaven. And, of course, the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar wants to do is try his gods. That were the wise men that he brought in. And now uh, brought in Daniel because he had contact with this heavenly God. So the king told Daniel the dream about a tree with big, vast branches. And in the tree it lodged food for the beasts, the birds, the people, the everything. Everything was plentiful. It was a prosperous time, it looked like, in this dream. Then a holy watcher from heaven cut down the tree, but he left a stump. Okay? There was a band of iron and brass around the stump for seven years. Well, what was the purpose of this dream, anyhow? When I was a student in Salem College, I often would take my camera and roam the hillsides. And I found uh, a tree that was growing out of a stump. Yeah. took a picture of it. The stuff was all rotten. Uh, there was very little left of it, but out of the middle of it was a new tree that was growing up from the stuff. Uh, that's what trees often do. Yeah. As long as the roots are in the ground and able to produce sap, a new tree will grow. Okay. And th this is similar to what we're talking about. Yes. Saying. But anyhow, this dream, the purpose of this dream, the purpose of this whole experience in this whole chapter was to teach the living people that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men. And he gives it to whoever he wills and sets up over the most humblest of men. Now, I interpret that not only for Nebuchadnezzar's time as with all the other stories of the Bible. They have a lesson that reaches to us today. Yes. And we are struggling in our own country and in other countries around the world. This is not unique to the United States. But in our country, we are in such turmoil right now. But in the long run, in the long haul, it is God who sets up kingdoms. It is God 
who sets up kings, princes, and presidents, if you will. It's God who has the final say in these things. In Nebuchadnezzar's day, in our day. He also brings them down. He brings them down, just like he did with Nebuchadnezzar, and he sets them up. So, uh, I watch the news with interest and determines in my own self uh, who causes the, the, the news to happen. Who sets up governments, presidents, kings, and so on around the world? Well, Dan's reaction to the dream. Dan was Daniel, I'm talking about. I guess they called him Dan in his day. But uh, he was shocked. He was greatly perplexed over this dream. Not that he didn't know the king or know the dream, but he knew that, hey, this was bad for the king. This was bad news. And the king is asking me to interpret it, and if I tell him that this was bad news, what's he going to do to me? He's going to off with my head, perhaps. Uh, because I was giving him bad news, and I should be giving him good news. Okay, so the dream was bad for the king, and the king insisted. And so Daniel told the king that he wished it was for Nebuchadnezzar's enemies instead of for Nebuchadnezzar. It would have been easier for him to tell. Well, Daniel's interpretation was a tree, and the tree was King Nebuchadnezzar. The tree grows, and it flourished, just like Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom grew in influence and in power throughout the whole world. It was the greatest. In several of the inscriptions that were later to find that Nebuchadnezzar himself wrote, he boasted that this is a peaceful shelter. We have lots of food. We have vast heaps of grain. I'm told that they had grain enough to last for how long? 20 years. That's a lot of stuff. I pass the, the grain storage bins on my way over, and they have big bins, and then they pile it on the on the road, and uh, or on the parking lot, I guess it is. And uh, they always had a pile, a big pile of corn that they put a tarp over. And this year, they had a big pile with a tarp over, and then another big pile without a tarp, and we talk about that every time we come past there. What are they going to do with that pot? Well, this is the kind of storage that Nebuchadnezzar had and uh, enough to keep his kingdom going. So think about this. They had uh, all of this storage and then they had the river running through the city as we saw and so Nobody could conquer them. They had double walls around the city. And uh, they could survive anything. Nothing could keep them from uh, being destroyed or any enemy coming in to, to harm them. The, the food supply and the water coming in and the double walls, they were safe and secure even if the Medo-Persians came and camped outside their city, which they did. And uh, you know, we'll see about that, what happened there a little later. But the stump 
with a band of, of uh, metal around the stump. The king, uh, the Daniel was telling the king that, that this band meant mental illness for the king. said that the king is going to act like a wild beast. Wow. A wild beast. And live outdoors, live in the fields. His hair will grow and be matted. It, it will, well, what we would call today a wild man. Yeah. For how long? Seven years. He, Daniel doesn't answer him in seven years. Uh, he says, until Nebuchadnezzar would acknowledge the fact that Jehovah is sovereign over the kingdom of men. The stump was left in the ground and it was God's promise that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom would be restored to him after he would acknowledge the fact that Jehovah is sovereign over the kingdom of men. And uh, this would be hard for Nebuchadnezzar to do. Uh, eventually it did happen to be seven years. But that wasn't the important thing. The important thing was if it took ten years or twenty years, it was until Nebuchadnezzar would acknowledge the fact that Jehovah, the God of heaven, is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. As you said, he was a slow learner. Yeah, he was. He could have acknowledged that before. Well, he could Saint have acknowledged Jehovah. that a couple chapters yeah, ago. exactly. But if he did, we wouldn't have all these stories. That's true. <laughs> okay. So what did Daniel do? He told him all of this dream and what was going to happen to him. And then he urged the king to, you can avoid all of this if you will just repent of all of the past things that you've done, especially during his great building projects. He had a number of them. That's what made him such a, a great king. But Daniel urged the king to rule justly over his kingdom. But what really happened? The dream really happened. It was one year later, and the king was walking on the roof of his palace, the palace of the Hanging Gardens, a good view of the entire city. And if you ever saw an ego trip, this is the best of them. Because Nebuchadnezzar is picturing him walking on the, on the roof of uh, the palace of the Hanging Gardens. And they have been very uh, popular place to go see. But... <laughs> Here was Nebuchadnezzar on the, on the roof and he was boasting that he himself made Babylon the greatest city on earth. Nobody helped him. No God, no people. It was him. It was Nebuchadnezzar. It was by his might and his power that all of this happened. It was his idea. It was to glorify himself. It was an ego trip, if there ever was one. The king's greatest hanging gardens. Uh, he built those uh, hanging gardens for his wife, who loved the mountains, and she wanted to be in the mountains. So Nebuchadnezzar built these hanging gardens. They weren't small, they were large. He designed a hydraulic system to lift the water from the Euphrates River up to the Hanging Gardens to keep them going. And as we know, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. 
while the king was boasting, mental illness set in. He was driven from the throne. He had to live in the open fields like a wild animal. His, in, his illness was called lichen therapy or something. Maybe the doctor could enlighten us on this. L-Y-C-N-T-H-E-R-P-Y. Mm -hmm. uh, it causes people to act like a wild animal. It, uh, and still, they're acting like a wild animal, but they still retain their inner consciousness. So the king, through it all, had the ability to change his attitude. Do you know anything about that, doctor? Or is that beyond you? Well, it sounds like a double personality, right? Okay, well, uh, psychiatric. As, as times go by, uh, we get different names for the same thing. And anyhow, this is what happened to the to Nebuchadnezzar. Um, <coughs> it was Daniel's dream, and then it came true exactly as Daniel prophesied it would. Now, this is the the uh, uh, interpretation of a true prophet. You, a true prophet is what percentage of being right? 100%. 100%. If you miss it one time, you're not a true prophet. Uh, that's the way it was explained in the Old Testament. I think that should still go. We have lots of prophets today, but I don't know about 100%. That's the way God says it should be. Well, it so happens that Nebuchadnezzar was out in the field like a wild man, uh, eating grass and whatever, for seven years. Can you imagine you or anyone living outdoors? Of course, it was warmer in that part of the world. But anyhow, living out in the, in the woods and the fields for seven years. A man of great intelligence, great wealth, great power, and living in the wild. A man like, well, like uh, Trump. He was a very wealthy man. He had uh, great power. This is before he became president, I'm talking. But he had all of these things. And can you imagine him being turned out in the woods to live on his own like an animal for seven <coughs> Well, Nebuchadnezzar finally recognized that he was in a situation that he couldn't control. All of his life he could control and demand this or that, and he got it. Now he was in a situation that he had no control over. He swallowed his pride. He humbly looked <coughs> to God. Matter of fact, he praised God. He expressed the sovereignty of God. And what did God do in return? What did Daniel promise? That that stump would be restored. And God restored Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom to him. And Nebuchadnezzar exalted God even more. Now in this whole story, who was in control? God was in control. Nebuchadnezzar had a tough time realizing that, that God was in control. We have a hard time realizing most times that God 
is in control of our lives. When situa tough situations come, we look somewhere else. And as a final last resort, we call upon God. But when we realize that God is sovereign, not over kings and men, but when we realize that God is sovereign over my life, recognize that he is, then we would de decide that we should go to God first instead of last in our lives. But since we have it backwards, that's the way it is, the way we do. Or are you different from me? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Do you have an experience in your life that you can share where you finally had to realize that God is the one that I should go to? I remember when I was manager of Cape Joy in West Virginia. I broke my ankle and was on crutches uh, Grandma Randolph had a bright red apron that had three pockets in front and I could put my Bible in one pocket I could put my knee timer in another pocket and the third pocket, I carried uh, different things that I was working on. Uh, as manager of Camp Joy, I was responsible for government uh, uh, food uh, products. And I had received the application for requesting these commodities. I knew that the deadline was coming up and I had three piles around my big chair of things that I was working on. I went through each pile to find this application. I could not find it. Finally, I prayed to the Lord, you know exactly where those forms are. I've looked, I can't find them. You guide me to, my, to, to where they are. And I was quiet. I reached in the side of the cushion of the chair in which I was sitting between the cushion and the arm, I put my hand down, and there were the forms. They were filled out in time, and we received the commodities. That was in answer to prayer, but it was a last resort prayer. Anybody else have a last resort prayer that they would want to share? So if we are all, how shall I say it? Uh, a more recent revelation that the Lord gave to me. Uh,
Satan, Satan's role under God's authority. Uh, he is the one who tests the authenticity of our faith. Our, is our faith genuine? Is our trust in the Lord really genuine? Genuine? Satan's job in the universe is to test our faith. How faithful are we to the Lord Jesus Christ? That's his entire purpose. That's what that's why God created him, and that's his job. My faith is being tested right now. Yes. Uh, and we're all tested. Well, as you know, my wife died this week, and she always received as a survivor's benefits. She got uh, a nice check from the government. Well, when she was totally disabled, I used that money. Now, Lorna died. I. My Social Security is all I have. Uh, we used all of our money to keep Lorna going over these last 10 years. And so I don't have enough money to pay my rent. My Social Security doesn't do that, and uh, let alone go to the Pizza Hut or any, anywhere else. So uh, I am trusting the Lord that he will supply my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I know that his riches are far beyond anything that man that I could even ask or think. So my faith is being tested now so that when the end of the month comes there's enough money in the bank to pay my rent. Now, I am not in any way asking anybody for any money. I uh, allow the Lord to provide it, and uh, I'm sure He will. I hope I don't have to go mad out in the woods, but at <laughs> least the summer's coming. <laughs> that would be helpful to get started anyhow. I think one of the most inspirational persons that I've ever read about was a man in England by the name of Mueller who ran an offering. Ran an orphanage. Okay. He had all these kids in his orphanage. His only means of support was the free will gifts the people would give them. And sometimes, even breakfast, they had nothing to eat. But the kids gathered in the dining area for breakfast. A bakery donated baked goods to the orphanage that had become their breakfast. That's the way God provided through other people. Mueller never asked for money. He just waited upon God and God supplied the needs of those orphanage children, all on faith. I understand. I read that. Yeah. Shall we call it a story? Sometimes when we call it a story, it's something that we don't believe really. But yes, that is a true story. More than once they sat down to a meal with nothing and just pray and thank God for that meal. And there was a knock on the door or something. It was always provided for them. And that, 
that is what I would call great faith. I think sometimes, well, like you said, um, sometimes prayer is the last resort, but it, it amazes me that God answers even the, even our simplest prayers sometimes. You know, I'm not too techni technologically smart, and I haven't been able to pick up my voicemail on my phone, and I read through the manual, I asked my husband, who should be able to help his wife, but... There's <laughs> another story. And um, finally, I just, I was so frustrated, I just said, God, please show me where I need to go to, uh, to find this out. And about that time, Dale said, why don't you Google it? And I thought, well, that's stupid. So I did. I asked Google the question. There it was. Laid out. I can now answer my voice. <laughs> I need to talk to you, Barb. <laughs> Don just gave me this smartphone. Oh, oh I'm, not, I'm not smart enough I'm to not, use it. I'm not very smart when it comes to that stuff either. I figured out how to make one phone call so far. And, uh, all the rest of it, uh, can't do it. Get a hold of any one of the teenagers in here, they'll help you. Yeah. We have a four-year-old grandson. <laughs> I go to the university to the children's center. Yes. yes. I'll take it along. Take it along. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's uh, our lesson for today.